Brian Wansink, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, it's great to be with you, Howard. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, so I've been following your work for a long time. I uh, I was just I was utterly fascinated by your book Mindless Eating, as much by the research methods as the conclusions, and you know it's and I loved how how these um, your your insights were kind of were adopted so readily by some of the you know most admired country companies in America as sort of a like an eighty twenty. Right, like we like new health and nutrition are so complex, so multifactorial, and they said like, here's a thing we can do. So um, that was kind of my introduction to your work. But I'd love for you just to, to 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 tell us a little bit about yourself, your research background, and kind of what led you to look at this idea of mindless eating and quantity and an environment yeah. as a huge determinant of our behavior. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, you know, the things I, I grew up in Iowa and, you know, I grew, kind of selling vegetables door to door and things like this. So I've always been very, very interested in food and the practical thing about getting people to consume them. I mean, because I mean, the, the crazy thing about like fruits and vegetables, for instance, just as an example, is that you can have an entire little wagon as an eight year old boy selling these things and one house will buy every single thing you have. And the next house looks at you like, you know, there's kryptonite or something in your wagon. And so clearly there's something going on that isn't just about education or about social de de demographics. But there's something else that goes on that kind of explains why we like the foods we eat and why we eat those. So it created this entire long uh, road of studying what are the psychological factors, the behavioral factors that influence our eating that we're not aware of. Because – those are the things that we can probably change very quickly. Mm -hmm. So you you were selling vegetables door to door, like you had a family farm or a stand, and you were just pulling. Yeah, yeah, and just dragging them by. Yeah, it's a it's kind of a, a funny image, but this is also back in the late 1960s, where you know there were sidewalks and there were neighbors and uh, things like that. Yeah. So well, that's fascinating that you. At some point, I don't know if it was when you were eight or much later that you you saw that like the differences in people's attitudes towards your little cart of produce varied, even though probably everyone went to the same church, the same school, the same civic events, the same county fairs. Like what? Yeah, they all have the same education. Yeah. When was the first Which time that you painful. began to be curious about like what are the differences? Oh, you know, what's interesting is when I when I was in my uh, master's program, I was in a master's program in, in, psych in uh, mass communication and journalism, and in interviewing people, you'd be asking these questions. And, and journalism is really uh, – one type of journalism is, is mainly um, kind of psychology. And so I really started saying, wow, segment differences, what could they possibly be? Because I know they're not demographic. Uh-huh. And I know they're not education. So what, what, what could they possibly be? And so that's what started then this, this whole sort of thing. And it's why uh, mindless eating eventually came up because I started doing all these experiments that said, wow, there are just wacky small things that influence people to eat a little bit more, or to pick up the thing on the left versus the right, or to like a food more than the person sitting right next to them. There's little bitty things that influence that, those attitudes and behaviors. And if we know what those are, we can set up our entire environment so that we eat a little bit better, we eat a little bit less, we like certain foods more, or, you know, the guests who come over to dinner like our food more. And that they're so simple to change. You don't have to go to the court on blue and become a chef. You don't have to get a PhD in nutrition or you don't have to go in one of these horrible deprivation diets where you, you know, you know I'm never going to eat cheese again, or you know, I'm I'm, I'm going to give up pizza for the rest of my life. You don't have to do that stuff. They're smaller, easier. As you mentioned, 80, 20 things that you can do that can make a big difference. Right. Of course, I I, I don't feel deprived by not eating cheese. I I would I would feel <laughs> deprived if I had some. I'm, uh, but uh, I, I know I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you know, Ru Russ and I are going to try to team, uh, tag team on you to, uh, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I started reading some of the psychology on 
how easy it is to change people's behaviors without their knowing. There was nothing about food in that early literature. I remember one study, I think out of Franklin and Marshall, that had people, it was like early 70s, and they were looking at like, what makes people do good deeds? And they found that if somebody like walked past the, the uh, phone booth and dug their finger in the coin return slot and found a dime, they were like twice as likely to help someone yeah. who, who dropped a package of, of file folders. And I, I remember reading this stuff and going, oh my gosh, like I have, I, my free will is a total illusion. <laughs> like I'm like I'm so easily manipulable. Um, yeah. What like what did you start seeing in the literature? Was it you know the early behavioral economists or like what what made you think that the the subconscious or the 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 things we don't notice could have such a huge impact on our behaviors? Yeah, that's such a, it's, it was the literature would be social psychology, uh, but I think what it largely became is that I would do all these crazy studies and things would come out wrong or they'd be a whole lot different than what they're supposed to be. And I'd try to figure out why was that? And it's like, oh, well, one explanation could be that this study was done at night and this one was done in the afternoon, but why would the night be different than the afternoon? And, and it, it created almost sort of a, a bottom up sort of thing that just by looking at data and going, whoa, holy cow, that's a difference. I would have never guessed mm. that this thing started sort of kind of bubbling to the top. But I think that you bring up a cool point in that, uh, a lot of the early stuff that looked at subconscious influences was was often done in a fairly abstract way, and all of mine is just specifically focused on food, which is which makes kind of things interesting. Is that um, and, and that's kind of unusual in academia that um, that a person's focus is on super practical solutions. Usually, things are a little bit more theoretical, and it, I think it led somebody. This might have been four or five years ago to kind of come up to me one time. He says, do you know what you are? You're a pracademic. <laughs> and, I, and, I go, and, I, and I don't, I think the guy meant it derisively or something. I'm like, wow, that is great. I, I love that word. <laughs> That's me. Yeah. That's hilarious. So, uh, you know, yeah, un unfortunately for your bank account, most of the things you invented are things that are actually going to make us fat. Right, like the the end the endless soup bowl. Can you, can you tell oh. us? I, I was so like I was so struck when I when I read that. Like I wanted one. Like, can you talk uh, about like how that came about? What it is? Just yeah, yeah just a, a little bit of background is that up to that point we've been finding all these crazy things that cause people to eat too much, uh, like you know the size of a plate or the size of a package. If you have a bigger plate, for instance, you end up pouring about twenty. 20% more uh, food on it. But you don't know you're doing that because it's the surface area is, is so huge. Um, you know, people pour more out of big cereal boxes and smaller cereal boxes. So we, we, we found all these things. But what we were running into was, was people, you know, we'd publish these papers and say, hey, look, so the solution is use smaller plates or, you know, you know, pour out of smaller containers or serve in smaller containers or whatever. And people would say, well, you know, I, I – I know you found that, but um, I know when I'm full. So um, that would never influence me. And so in one study, we ended up looking at French versus Chicagoans as to how they determined their dinner was over. Okay. And we asked them a bunch of questions. And basically the French would say, you know, I know my dinner is over when I'm no longer hungry or the food no longer, longer tastes good. I mean, those are like internal cues, you know, your tummy or your tongue that you're through eating. But the uh, Chicagoans we looked at uh, were more likely to say, I know I'm through eating dinner when the plate's empty or when the TV show I'm watching is over. <laughs> and those are like external cues to stop eating. And it made us say, well, what would happen if your bowl never ended? If it never emptied, would you just keep like eating like kind of the family dog until you blew up? And, um, and so what we did was I did a couple different studies and found that, yes, you would. <laughs> but to, to do it in a way that was kind of very vivid, we created this, this a refillable soup bowl. And it's a, basically a, we had three different tables, and these tables had – big six quart cauldrons of soup that had uh, tubes running underneath them and connected to soup bowls. There's holes drilled in the 
um, table that you wouldn't see. And we found that when people came down and started eating soup, if their soup bowl refilled, they'd eat about 73% more soup. But they wouldn't realize they had done it. They'd rate themselves just as full and everything. And, you know, the, the big point behind that was to, to communicate to people, um, mainly kind of academics, that, yes, you may say that something like the size of a plate or the size of a, a package or what the person is doing next to you, you know, won't influence how much you eat because you know when you're full. However... In this entire study, nobody realized they were full because they used their eyes, and not their stomach. Uh -huh. Well, this reminds yep. me of, of something that I came across a little while ago about these like uh, sommeliers and wine experts who were like almost entirely fooled into thinking that white wine was red wine because they added food coloring. Yeah, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, I, I did a uh, I did some study for it, or I did some something on a TV show like I think Mind Games or Headspace or something like that. And we did a, a bunch of a bunch of little studies like that, and that's one of the things that we did was something analogous to that. Uh -huh. So I'm just I'm just really I really curious about like how you go about. You have this idea for refillable bowls. Just from a practical standpoint, how do you do? You find engineers to do this? Do you go down to your like you know auto mechanics shop and say, hey, do you have some tubes and compressors? Like. How do, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know. Like, how do you begin to think yeah. about constructing something as diabolical as a never-ending soup bowl? <laughs> uh, you know, actually, that that is a, that's a great question, and actually, I I, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to answer it because that was particularly perplexing because I had had this idea and was designing it, and I found a little restaurant that let this happen and stuff, and I, I couldn't get it right. And I worked with this other guy, and, and we just couldn't figure it out. We'd have soup that was, like, spurting up in people's faces. And, <laughs> and, and I used to go up or down or gurgle. In fact, you know, here's, here's how much of an you know, idiot that, you know, a lot of initial efforts are in research. And, and actually, there's a funny expression. that They said, um, if we knew exactly what the answer was going to be, we wouldn't call it research. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but what uh, you did, we were doing all these things I couldn't get to figure out. And then I realized what the problem was, was as we were using chicken noodle soup, like the chicken and the noodles were plugging up the tube. Uh. You know, the, so I'm like, oh, okay. So we went to tomato soup, but I still, I couldn't get it figured out. And, and you know, I did a crazy thing. I went and I, I found a undergraduate. So at the time I was a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is a crazy great engineering program. And I, Went to some undergraduate in, um, I think it's fluid mechanics or fluid mechanic engineering or something like that. And, and said, like, you know, basically pizza and Mountain Dew if you could help me figure it out. And <laughs> done. <laughs> and he did, it, he, he did it in, like, I don't know, two hours. I thought, oh, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so one of the tricks was, was not having chunky things that we're going to – Yes. Gonna... Yeah, uh, and another thing was asking a smart engineering undergraduate student to, to, to figure it out. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. So so then the setup was so people come and they're sitting down at the table and there's the soup bowl. And do they do they think it's weird that the bowl is like bolted to the table or Oh. Yeah, no, they they would. And in fact in some of the initial pilot studies that they did. So what I ended up doing is uh, drilling a bigger hole in the, in the table, like maybe about this size. Uh -huh. And so, and so, and there's a, the, the tube that went into the bowl was flush mounted to the bottom of the bowl. And so they, they could actually move it around a little bit. Um, okay. and not, and not see anything strange going on. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I think we, we kind of, we kind of told people ahead of time to something along the lines of, uh, something, uh, something like, Hey, you know, um, um, you know, this is, we're trying to keep things kind of neat and clean here, you know, mm -hmm. so, uh, um, just kind of the table's set pretty nice. So just don't, just don't mess anything up. Uh -huh. And okay. it, it, was, it wasn't bowl specific, but it was enough. Mm -hmm. I think of a prompt. There were only a couple people who actually, um, kind of figured out anything was going on. We, one guy tried to pick it up. So. <laughs> oh, okay. 
soups. Well, you, you found people <laughs> ate almost twice, had almost twice as much soup from the same bowl when it was, you know, it was like slowly refilling to the point where they didn't really notice. Not at all. You would never, ever see it refill. Yeah. It's, it's, which is, which is amazing in and of itself. Like that people wouldn't notice. Did, would, would you, were you worried before you started testing this, that people would go, Hey, what's going on? I yeah. Initially, initially. And so but the thing is, you realize that we, as people, we are so easily influenced by things that we said, Hmm. So what could we do that's natural that would get people to um, not realize anything's going on or not focus on the bowl? Well, the first thing is you don't have them eat alone. In, in a lot of studies, they put people alone in a cubicle and they study something and you know, somebody's like looking at it and they're being filmed. And, mm. and so this is set up like a restaurant. It was a four top, four people sitting at the table. And um, – and then, so we did that a few times, and we realized that sometimes it became kind of awkward because the people didn't know each other. They'd kind of eat and kind of hmm. just eat. And so what we did then is we said, okay, now let's, now let's try this. Let's, let's go to people, and when they're doing this, say um, uh, a, a couple different things. I, th I think we asked them about um, what we like you to do is a, kind of just – Talk about what uh, you guys, your plans are for like, like Christmas vacation or the for a summer vacation they're planning or something like that. Because this, this study went on for a long time. Uh -huh. uh, and so, but once you get somebody to talk about what they did for vacation or what they're going to do for vacation, you know, they get engaged and they start talking about that like normal people would. And they're not students. Uh -huh. And it's, it's much more natural. It's much more, um, you know, it's much more natural to, uh, um, you know, eat with other people and eat in these situations that is to just do so in a, you know, lab in a basement somewhere. So, I mean, it's interesting. Um, about a year and a half ago, a couple of critics came after me and said, oh, my gosh, your your field studies are so loose. They're so, they're so crazy. You know, there's all these little problems with them and stuff. And the nice thing about field studies is it shows something works in a real life. But then also the nice thing is that, Almost everything we've done has been redone in labs and other situations. And, that, and, you know, and it shows that a lot of these findings are really robust, but they are particularly strong when you get real people in real situations. Uh -huh. In other words, this, this works in practice, but does it work in theory? <laughs> That's right. Well, it works in practice, and it, but it works in, in real places even better than it does in artificial places, Right, so, which is what most of us are doing here. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you call your book Mindless Eating, which brings people to think about, OK, so now what I have to do in order to overcome is I have to sit down and be a monk and breathe and like <laughs> put down my fork before, between everybody. But you're you're not saying that we have to somehow like overcome our natural impulses to be social, to enjoy each other's company. You're saying that if, that because we are mindless eaters, we can take some steps, environmental steps um, that can protect us when we don't have the, the mindfulness to protect ourselves. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because the thing is, if you can be mindful and, you know, focus on the pee and enjoy the flavor and things like this, that, is incredible because you'll love food more, you'll eat less in most studies. It's, it's a great way to do that. And it works for 5 or 10% of the population. But for the rest of us, I don't think our lives would even really allow it that well because we're coming home and you know the kids are screaming. We've got a big to-do list. There's a telemarketing phone call. The dog has to go out. You know, and for us to eat the pee with our eyes closed is just not going to work for us. So we have to come up with another solution. And I, I believe that the easy sort of 80-20 solution for a lot of people is to just set up their environment and use some of the, these rules of thumb so they can mindlessly eat less and still enjoy the people around them, still enjoy the food, still not have to – to move to you know and live the life of an aesthetic 
<laughs> right. So, so, but, um, <laughs> right. Cause, they, cause you know, I, I have subscribed to that and ever like I would every so often I would have this like, okay, I'm going to eat mindfully from now on. And then like two days later, I find myself like pacing. I don't, I'm not even sitting down at a place setting. <laughs> yeah right and then and i feel oh, like i failed again um as yeah. opposed to like make you know setting the table every day so like oh that's the nicest place to eat and kind of looking out the window and not having the tv on or the radio on and just removing some of the distractions that otherwise i'm, I'm powerless to resist yeah you know in so many cases when people start this, this to make a change in their life, they often go through this deprivation dieting. And it's kind of the sort of thing where they say, oh, I'm not going to eat X, Y, or Z. And those are X, Y, or Z. There's a reason to eat those because they love those foods. And, and those sort of diets, uh, you know, they might work for a little while, but at some point, it's just depriving yourself of anything you really, really love, whether it's food or TV or affection or music, or whatever, just comes back to blow up. But like you also said, and I think this is interesting, is is that um, when people try to make changes, they often try to do too much. In fact, the last chapter in Mindless Eating um, looks at the idea that when we give people even the three changes that we know behaviorally are going to make the most difference in their specific life, in their specific situation, their specific problems, um, even three changes is way too much for most people. And most people can handle about one at a time. And then if they can do that for a while, eventually two, three, four weeks later, when they start, start seeing a little bit of change, it can then trigger other mm -hmm. changes, but to not start off very large at all. Right. And I find most, most people don't have the this, this self-confidence that they can change at all because they've tried to, you know, bite off more than they could chew or not bite off less than they could chew like yeah. okay and so they think of it in terms of deprivation and so yeah, there's yeah. Um, there's there's always a blowback and there's always their own experience is yeah I'm going to try again but this doesn't work whereas if you give people the smallest possible change to make and they discover that oh they can do it because it's so small it's not even a big deal like I'm going to use the 9 inch instead of the 11 inch plate yeah, that's exactly right. Or I'm going to serve, uh, I'm not, not going to have any serving bowls on the table unless it's salad. I'm mm -hmm. going to serve all my meat and potatoes off of a side counter. Uh -huh. um, you know, even that's something, you can see, even the person with the least discipline in the world can say, you know, I think I can do that. I can just, yeah, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave the chicken and the pasta over on the, over on the counter. Uh-huh, yeah. Go we'll, we'll back and get it. Right. And, and we, we you know, I think I can't remember who talked about like the, the 20 second rule, which is if like something is, tw is, is 20 seconds worth of uh, inconvenient. Yeah, probably going to let it go. Whereas if it's, if it's right, like 20 seconds is enough to stop you from doing most things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the thing is, and what you touch on, which is really interesting, is that something needs to be super, super simple. Yeah, and and so I, this is this is kind of funny. This is a oh, this might have been about a few. This is a few years ago. This is a little bit after Mindless Eating came out, but just before Slim by Design came out. Somebody somebody called a reporter called and said, "Hey, you know, I, can I get your thoughts on this? Um, I think I think it might have been a study that was done or something that showed that if a person if a person was eating and after every time they took a bite." They set their fork down and counted to like 10. Okay. And then, you know, took another bite that they would eat a lot less food. Uh. I thought, yeah, I, I'm positive they will. That one meal, they're just never going to do it a second time. <laughs> Who in the world is going to put a fork down and count to 10 after every minute? You know, just you know, that's sort of the uh, forever alone sort of person. <laughs> Well, you know, oh. I, that's exactly what I would do. Like, I would go to these, like, meditation or self-development retreats. And after, oh, yeah. after, like, the morning, I'd be like, I am such a spiritual person. And I would sit there and I would, you know, and I would, like, be so self-conscious of being natural. that I just, oh, I just oh, felt yeah. like the, the most fake person in the world. Like, this is so not who I am. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. You sit and yeah. smile yeah. and smell the food. <laughs> 
Yeah. Oh, and I wasn't seeing anything. I wasn't seeing anything bad about meditation or anything like that. In, in fact, I you know meditate a little bit every morning. But um, just about the idea of just being a little bit, you know, too extreme with things. Yeah, because yeah, in the certain studies, those things are extreme and they work. But that's why they're not done in field situations because you know you yeah. never get anybody to do it the second time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, for me, meditation is about kind of come to a natural state of being. Like for me, living in this modern world where there's always you know telemarketers and screaming babies and dogs and bills to pay, like that's not what I evolved for, right? Like I evolved <laughs> to like you know dig up roots and protect my family from animals and build huts and like like I can handle that, <laughs> and, and so to to become like instead of me trying to adapt to this world to do what you suggest and to to make these simple one time decisions that then allow me to protect myself. Yeah. And it's funny. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like the idea of we're probably, we're probably better built to not meditate, but to be walking around the, the neighborhood with a spear. I mean, that's probably more along the lines of what we're yeah, more I mean, natural. Yeah. Like I'm sure at night we'd light the fire. We watch the sun go down. We would naturally meditate because like these vistas would, uh, would, would induce it. Right. Like, you know, <laughs> how, what, you know, you just want to sort of, you know, you're in a beautiful natural, you're sitting by the beach, you're watching the waves, you're like, oh, I just want to sit and not think for a little while, like, as opposed to turn it into this really unnatural process that has to, like, overcome all of my human impulses for, for like, keeping busy. <laughs> That's right. That's good. So um, <laughs> what, what are you working on? Now, I know you did, you've done a lot of sort of consulting for uh, um, like Google. I remember I went out to the Googleplex and they showed me like your influence, like, like you know, they didn't mention you by name, but they go like, and here's our small plates because we and we took M&Ms out of the line of the cafeteria. I'm like, oh, that's Wansig's work. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So are you, are you still working with with organizations? Are you what's what's your latest uh yeah, yeah. So a lot of uh, big organizations and trying to develop or developing for them um, plans, helping them implement plans that can change, for instance, all their cafeteria so they all guide people to make healthier choices, even though the same indulgent foods are there. It guides people to take an apple instead of cookies. And, and you know, we've already done this with 29,000 schools in the United States. We call it the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. So if you go into one of those schools – um, you know, you'll find that the healthiest entree is always first. What they cue and what they advertise are the the healthy or, or the healthiest stuff is the specials because that triggers people to be more likely to be healthy. Even if they don't get the special, they get healthier subsequent things. We've it's changed the way milk sold um, and things like this, and it's a really cool program. It's a free program. That's why there's twenty nine thousand schools using it. Gotcha. So I remember reading, I think it might have been in one of Kelly McGonigal's books, maybe The Willpower Instinct, where she talked about like blowback, like when McDonald's added salads to their menu, it actually increased the consumption of like burgers and fries and shakes because people looked at the salad and like convinced themselves that they had already had it by just considering it. So did you, do you, do you, how does, yeah. how does the, how the, uh, the Smarter Lunchroom movement deal with the idea of like, okay, Here's a healthy thing, so now I'm off the hook. Oh, yeah, because it doesn't change the foods. The same foods are being offered, but what it does is just sets things up so people unknowingly get guided toward picking up an apple instead of the cookie they do. And that's the, the key is being mindless because once it becomes mindful, people kind of say, okay, I need to reward myself. Uh. And that's what causes this blowback. But if they don't realize – they were influenced in the first place. There's nothing to reward yourself for. Because they're like, yeah, I just picked up an apple. Why? I don't know. It just felt like it. Huh. I don't know. So they didn't consciously make that effort and say, now I need a good boy reward. Uh -huh. So that, that just brought up, that kind of blew my mind, just what, what you just said. Because, like, philosophically, it raises a really thorny issue of, like, you know, free will. Right. Like if people are being mind are, are being guided to eat healthier and they it's it works when they don't even know it's happening, which is like totally makes sense to me. Like if you if I feel like I'm being influenced, right, like, you know, as I was in sales for a long time, we used to say people love buying. They hate being sold to. 
And it's it's sort of the same thing. Like nobody wants to be influenced. Like, is it was that kind of a key tenet of of the the whole project? Wait. It, 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 it's consistent with it. It's just the whole thing of just not giving people the, the opportunity to reward themselves. And they don't feel they need to reward themselves if they don't think that they did something healthy. They just did what they wanted to do. And the fact it happened to be something healthy, it's like, well, I don't know. I, you know, I didn't use my own volition yeah. to do that. It just, it just seemed good. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, that's, that's what works, seems to work really well for a lot of us. And the environment's going to influence you one way or the other, regardless of what it is. So we might as well set it up so it does it for the good. Mm. So would you recommend that people, like, hire someone else to set up their environment and not tell them? It's like, you know, the minute I, like, I know, oh. like, oh, I'm using the nine-inch plate. Yeah. You know, you know the, the funny thing about that is that it doesn't even, when you do it to yourself, it, it, you know, you, you, you set it up, but you, you're not say, saying, you know, I'm eating a lot more fruit because I have a fruit bowl. So therefore, I'm going to reward myself. It, it doesn't – it just seems to fall in the back of your mind because it wasn't that important of a decision to make in the first place to put uh -huh. a fruit bowl. So, it, you know, it, it would – if somebody did it for you and told you why they were doing it, it would influence you at that point. But three weeks later, you know, um, it would be having the same impact and you wouldn't even think about it. It's almost like you're telling people, like, don't make such a big deal about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and some people, uh, we used to do these um, these big these big clinic things, and people would kind of wring their hands about what the perfect change is to make. And it's like it's like uh, sometimes people thinking about exercise programs, just like, oh, what would be the perfect sort of exercise? And, uh, and for most people, it's just like, just do something. And after you, you get moving – then we can start adding in the more perfect stuff. Uh -huh. Just oh, just get going. And even when people say, give me your 10 best tips or whatever, it's just like, you know, I, I could, but I need to know a lot about you. And 10 tips would just be so overwhelming for you. You would you'd take zero away. Okay. Uh -huh. right. You know, like it's one, two or three would be all you could do at a time. Once you master those, we can talk about the next step. Right. So, so in some ways, you are you are fighting against industry, because right, uh, we're like roughly the American food industry produces maybe two to three times as many calories as we can possibly consume, and they need to move those calories. And the easiest way to move them is to get us to consume them. Have Have you seen any examples of food companies taking your research and like turning it on its head to actually increase consumption? Oh, no, actually, actually, no, no, I'm not. And, and actually, I'm not fighting the food industry because I think the food industry is going to be the solution in a lot of cases. And a great example of that is the 100-calorie pack that when back in 1995, I was able to convince some of these food companies that they would make more money selling less food. Hmm. Um, they would kind of go, well, first of all, they'd kind of go, what? What? That doesn't make any sense. And actually, I... I, I recount this story in the introduction of uh, the book Slim by Design. And they said, well, that doesn't make any sense. But then after they started thinking, they're like, yeah, that makes sense. If, if we can make more money, because we're not in this to make people fat, we're just in it to make a lot of money. And if we can sell less food to make more money, hmm. and it ended up being a great win. It ended up being a great win-win situation. Uh -huh. So I guess they all knew that, uh, you know, this, you can buy a, a, a 12 ounce can of Coke for the same price as the three liter bottle, right? This, yeah, right. That's like, right. Oh, they're, yeah. all, they're all a buck 25, right? How does that work? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, with the soft drink companies, I don't know, because this, these are mainly the, uh, you know, the pack of the snack companies who I initially met with snack companies and Kellogg's also, uh -huh. who I initially met with, who made the, the initial changes, the Nabisco, Eminem Mars, um, and Kellogg's. Right. right. And I know this, you know, because um, my business partner, Josh Lajani, used to weigh 420 pounds. And he talks about, you know, we'll talk about like serving sizes, like how to read a label. He says, no, when you're a fat guy, the serving size is the package. Right. Like, mm -hmm. when it, you know, it's, it's this it's the sleeve, yeah. it's the sleeve of Oreos or it's the whole box of Oreos. It's not yeah. like, oh, look, it says three cookies is a pack is a serving size. So that yeah. you, what you did with the hundred calorie packs is you, is you created like this visual and and behavioral barrier. Like you can, 
you can stop at three or four cookies, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. But you know, even that was the was the, happened because of a mistake we had made in, in a research project. We were we were looking at we were doing something in movie theaters and we we're giving people kind of um, bigger, different sized bags of snacks. And in one case, what happened was we ran out of we were putting them in kind of like you know the Ziploc containers. Uh -huh. And what happened is that um, somebody bought, instead of the big ones, they bought really small ones. And we had all these people showing up. And so what we did is instead of putting 400 calories, 440 calories, a big thing, we put 110 calories in four little ones and just gave those out. But we found that people didn't consume hardly any of them. They consumed 100, 100 or 200 calories, but not the whole thing. And – he said, well, maybe it's the fact that it's in these different size bags. And that was actually so it was actually an accident that caused us to initially say, wait a minute, this seems to work. Uh, and we did some follow-up stuff, and, and so it kind of came up by an accident. Well, I can see why your research has to be naturalistic. Because if you're, you know, if you're trying to be, quote, scientific and control every variable, and you discover that the size of the Ziploc bag that you're uh, purchasing manager brings to you makes a difference, you can get paralyzed into thinking like, we can't know anything. Like, you know, the, the Zodiac could make a difference or the ambient temperature <laughs> you know, or a butterfly flapping its wings in, the, in another hemisphere could make a difference. It's like we, ha we have to find these naturalistic approaches because there's always going to be, like everything you add to it is going to affect replicability. <laughs> yeah, I like that the zodiac could make a difference. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, that, that's that's you know. So we had found a while back. So I, like, if we take a look at just plate size, for instance, we found. Um, so we find in all of our studies, and a bunch of other people find in the studies that you, if you're in a real environment, you know, you, you serve about twenty percent more. But when these things tend to be done in labs, they tend to find a smaller difference, and so it's. There's an interesting paper that was written a while back that looked at all these studies and says, well, the lesson for this is that plate size doesn't work very well if somebody is watching you while you eat and you know it. Huh. <laughs> so, so that's why we need to put things in kind of, I think, in real environments because that's what – that's where you find what really makes the big difference and what doesn't. And if it doesn't work in a real environment, it's not really a solution anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's like the first thing I remember ever studying about social science. And this was probably in like high school, 10th grade was the Hawthorne effect. Yeah, right? that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I know. The first time I heard about it, I went, wow, that's crazy. But I mean, we've, you know, so I guess they've known about this since the 50s, but a lot of social science ignores it. And basically for people who don't know, the Hawthorne effect was like this, I think it was a Johnson's control um, factory where everything they did increased productivity. Even things that were like totally the opposite, like, oh, this increased productivity. This, and it turns out that the one factor was the employees knew they were being watched. <laughs> That's an increased productivity. Yeah. It's funny, you know, they turn the lights up, productivity goes up. They turn the lights down, productivity goes up. And it's just being watched that made the difference. Yeah. So you're discovering, like, so I'm imagining places like Google and Facebook are obsessive about data. Like they've put your, I don't know, actually, I'm not, I'm not positive. Does Facebook uh, use your stuff as well? I know Google yeah. does. Yeah, you know, we got it. We got a bunch of phone calls um, from Facebook. And what I did is I, I sent them the stuff that we had, that we had done uh, for some of these other companies. And then I also sent them the chapter in Slim by Design that's, that's about companies and about cafeterias. And so I think they might have just went ahead and implemented it themselves. Uh -huh. I mean, and that would, that would get them 60% there. I mean, if, if I'm there, I can go a little bit farther. Or, but, you know, right. if they just read the stuff and say, okay, we'll do that. Right, and right. Well, I'm, that, just, I'm just curious whether you've gotten, like, for data from them, you know, because there's all these these controversies about replicability and, and study design and, and and yet, you know, we both know that you want to be a uh, what did you say a a a, a prac academic a prac yeah. So like, if Google is keeping track, or you know, like I'm wondering if you have any corporate data or schools data about purchasing and consumption. Oh yeah, tons and tons. I mean, we we track like it's, we don't track all twenty seven thousand schools, but we track at least a sample of five thousand of them every year. 
see what works better and what seems to work a little bit less better and what people adjust to and things like that. Cause uh, that's, what we find. Um, that's what we find is really great is if it, if it gets replicated actually in practice on a real um, cafeteria line, then, then we're like, yeah. Mm-hmm, gotcha. But I mean, some, some, some of these things need an awful lot. If, if, if a change, making a change needs an, a lot of monitoring, then it's a little bit hard to pick up uh, to, to see if it's working or not. So, but, it, but it's the ones that the, the easier they are, the simpler they are, the 80, 20 percent ones. Yeah. That's, what's great to see work. Right. So if you simply move what, uh, where things are in the buffet line. Yeah. I mean, if there's a, there's, there's an 11% chance that people are about 11% more likely to take whatever they see first. So, you know, uh-huh. Put something healthier first. <laughs> right. And by the way, yeah. you know, so I'm, we're we're videotaping this for so people who are listening. But this this is my water bottle. It's a uh, it's a half gallon, and this is <laughs> this is totally because of your work, right? Because I would like, oh, I'll have a glass. Like normal people would have a glass of water, and so great. Yeah. I, I would eat. A, I would drink a glass of water a day, and they're like, no, I want more. So I would get like a quart jar. Like great, but how many yeah. glasses of water do I want to eat a day? I want I want to drink eight glasses of water a day. There's my water glass right there. Uh, that's, that's a nice big red one. And I'm like, so if I want to drink eight glasses of water a day, why am I having a four a four glass jar on my desk? Why not just have the eight glass jar and that have them all there? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, I look at it. I, I'm looking at it right now. It's at a, you know, it's at um, four and a half, four and a half. It's like you're not done. You got you got you to keep going. Yeah, what I want to do is I want, I want you to have like one of those. Uh, those big gallon kind of milk jug like things that you can kind of like, you know, put around the drink like that, like it's moonshine. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that was, that was, <laughs> and I believe, I believe that works for triceps as well. <laughs> so now, now what I need, what I need is a, 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 a refillable water. So like, like the soup bowl, I'm sure water would be very easy. We, we, I think we could do that. That'd be a whole lot easier than uh, chicken noodle soup. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so what are you? Uh, what's your uh, research agenda for the next uh, year or two? What are you looking at? Yeah. Well, so so one cool set of stuff that we're just we're just finishing up is looking at all these ways to reduce household food waste, the amount of food that we throw away. And we come up with some. I mean, some really really kind of cool things. Um, but then the other thing that we're working on that that I think is is so cool is now family feeding. And, you know, you get a lot of parents and they, they kind of feel like a lot of fun went out of their life when they had kids. They're not the, they're not the cool 27-year-old they thought they are going to be. <laughs> they always dreamed they'd be. You know, now they feel middle-aged and they're, they feel like they're doing nothing more than running a food service for their family or whatever. And so we're looking at all these cool studies that show small things that parents can do while feeding kids that get kids to eat healthier, but also – and it being empowering to them. Either it makes them feel more creative, it makes them feel more appreciated, or it gets um, their kids to talk about something that's going on at school. And so we're looking at solutions like that, and I'm going into all these houses and talking to the parents, and we're doing these big, huge-scale studies to, to now just to get all these good best practices about what people do that helps them feed their kids better, they think, but also – they get some reward out of that that makes them feel like uh, the person they want to be and not just like uh, can, just a feeding machine. Yeah. Can you give an example? Uh, yeah. I mean, one example would be uh, we find that um, people who um, – one thing is, is that um, the better your attitude is about something – Okay, about you know, it shifts just slightly how healthy you eat, how many calories you eat, and the mix. Okay, so we did a bunch of studies that showed that when we put people in positive moods versus just slightly negative moods, I mean, just a little, we're talking a little bit of a mood difference, that they ended up eating about uh, 9% less if they're in a happy mood, but the mix of what they ate was also healthier. And you know, you can say, well, what would be some things you can do? I mean, you, you can do something ridiculous like you know like write a paragraph about why you're happy before you eat dinner but who's going to do that but instead if you just do very something very simple is to say okay we're going to go around the table and we're all, all going to say one cool thing that happened to us today okay 
Okay, Audrey, you start. Oh. Simply doing something like that is enough to change this mood a little bit. But it also lets mom and dad feel a little more connected because they hear something cool that Audrey did. Uh, then Audrey and whoever else gets to hear something cool that happened to mom and dad. Uh -huh. Or that or that maybe nothing really great that cool happened to mom and dad. Maybe they shouldn't have expectations that every day is going to be a miracle day. Uh huh. Great. So, because when you were first talking about this, I was thinking like you know making faces out of fruit or. Oh yeah, no, this this is stuff that's almost not fruit related. Uh, it's very that yeah, it has an impact on food, but it's has a bigger impact on you as a person. Yeah, and again, this is stuff that I can imagine is sort of hard to replicate outside of a natural setting. If you say, you know, families that talk to each other, get along, look for positivity, eat better. Like, how do you control for that? It's like, that's so use, it's such a useful insight. And yet the, there's, going, there's always going to be uh, someone who can statistically disprove it, right, at some level. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the danger of doing things in field exam situations, right? in field, uh, field study situations, and doing things in the real world. Is that there's all these kind of loose things, and and you know people can beat them up if they want to. But I mean, that is I think the way that good discoveries happen and how good change happens. Right. Well, you know, I mean, we can argue about you know, the impact of carbohydrates or fats or trans fats or, you know, various things. We can have like scientific debates about that. I, I think it's going to be hard to tell someone like, well, Neil, the risks, if what if Brian's wrong about this, the risks of having a happy family are <laughs> like, are what? Are you yeah, right. <laughs> uh, That's true. I, I, Especially I, these simple things. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. It reminds me a little bit of the work of um, Greg Walton, the, his wise interventions, where they do these like little bitty things up at the you know, sort of at the beginning of a semester that gets people to, to sort of iteratively change how they view and interact with the world. Like if you're sitting down to a meal and you know that, OK, dinner with my family is this time where I get to express myself and I get reinforced for the best of who I am. Like I, the cascading effects of that go far beyond. Am I eating grapes instead of um, you know Oreos? Yeah, <clears throat> and it might also help, help. Might also help contribute to people not bringing their cell phone and spending the whole time texting Bobby or whatever underneath the table. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 have, I have three. I have three middle school girls. So that's why. That's why I'm using all these examples of real names. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well. I, I mean, just as I'm thinking about it, like the your endless soup bowl is exactly what um, infinite scrolling is. Right. There's always another thing. There's always something else on the Instagram or the Facebook feed. That's true. It's true. Right. Like this. Reddit, it never quits. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. people can, you know, they just reverse engineer your findings. They can addict us pretty easily to stuff. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, I, I know you got to go. Um, I really thought, thank you for taking the time. This has been I've been looking forward to talking with you for for years and years because I've just been so inspired by the, the, the spirit of creativity that you bring to your work. Like like when I read your books, it's like. Boy, research can just be fun. <laughs> well, you should have called earlier, and we could have uh, we could have done an interview years and years ago. Then. Oh well, I felt like I was, you know, punching above my <laughs> above my weight class. So it's uh, oh. it's good to know that uh, I can get you on the phone. That's good. That's so good. thank you for for everything you do. So you have uh, you have mindless eating. You have slim by design. Anything else? Slim by design. Well, those are the, those are the two that that really really help people's lives like us. The other, the other books are more like for researchers, like marketing nutrition or mm -hmm. uh, asking questions. Those okay. are more like. Great. So those are the books I'll read when I want to feel smarter than other people. <laughs> and, and, and become better rested. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll have my, uh, my gallon jug in one hand and my academic textbook in the other. <laughs> I just, I just love that vision of your hand and you like up on your shoulder like those, like those, you know, those, those, those moonshine jugs. Uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, it's funny. 
Awesome. Well, Brian Watson, thank you so much for all the work you do, for the spirit you bring to inquiry, and for taking the time today. Great. And, you know, if people are interested more, they can go to the website healthierbydesign.org. Healthierbydesign.org. Great. I'll put that uh, link in the show notes as well. Healthierbydesign.org. Brian Wansink, thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.